Coming up today on Locked On Texas Tech, hopping in the DeLorean, traveling back in time, exploring McCaslin methodology. Next on Locked On Texas Tech. You are Locked On Texas Tech, your daily podcast on the Texas Tech Red Raiders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We're going to start this thing off right. Great to see you again on Locked On at Texas Tech on the Locked On Podcast Network. Thanks for making us your first listen again on YouTube or anywhere you get podcasts with the only Chris Level. I'm Casey Cowan. And Chris, we are still, of course, waiting on final resolution as it relates to Texas Tech's head coaching search. But today we're going to spend some time pretending we know it's going to be Grant McCaslin. And if something was to take a hard turn in the other direction at the end of this week, sue us, okay? Because we're going to spend some time here today talking about Coach McCaslin and in some ways relating it, obviously, to the future of Red Raider Hoops, Chris. But in doing so, we're going to be looking back to the past, not only of Texas Tech basketball, especially in some recent years, but also of Grant McCaslin. I I want to get to some more thoughts from Coach McCaslin here recently as it relates to something you and I have talked about, and that is team building. And this has probably been, well, a lot of things have changed about college basketball, Chris, in recent years, but this may have been one of those that kind of just wraps it all up. The way you put together a team, what wins? What gets you through the NCAA tournament? Is it young guys? Is it old guys? High school guys? Transfer guys? A lot of different ways to skin this cat, I suppose, Uh, But, man, you and I as Tech fans and everybody else who's listening to this or watching this has experienced a pretty unique ride going back through the Chris Beard era, a short amount of time with Mark Adams. When it comes to putting teams together, because we kind of got used to a whole lot of turnover and just reacclimating yourself in each and every season, and we were trying it again this time around, but kind of came back to bite you, right, as uh, the experiment went awry, I guess, so to speak. (laughs) Yeah, I, I just I, – I don't think that the way your team this year was put together is 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 ideal, speaking of, of Texas Tech, just because – and I think as we've talked about along the way some, I don't know if you ultimately intended for as many of these freshmen to have to play key roles as they did, but this is what happened. I think – but that is because you – you had an injury to Fardos, okay? So that 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 opens up a, a whole dynamic. Then I think you also had you missed, and, and I don't I don't mean to sound harsh there. I'm just being realistic, and I think the head coach and the and the staff felt this way because they didn't play these guys a ton at all. You missed on Curran Walton and Demorion Williams, okay? If you have a healthy AMAC and you have if you hit on one or both of those guys it really allows the freshmen to kind of come along and, and, and maybe get some spot duty. Maybe pop plays a bit, maybe Lamar plays a bit, maybe Jennings plays a bit, maybe Elijah plays a bit. I don't know, but they were all kind of thrust into to big time roles and played a ton of minutes. And I just don't know if that's conducive in this league. Uh, and, and, and what sucks is, is you may, you could theoretically lose them all. You know, they could all leave here. And then it was like, what was the point? You know, now right. that's because of the the staff change and all that stuff. But there needed to be a payoff for, for that to have been worth it. Otherwise, otherwise, I'm I'm rolling the dice and, and taking a crack at the portal with the with a junior or senior, even if I only get him for one or two years, that could help me right now. If there's no payoff long term, but but I think that. I think there's a few coaches out there that are able to, if you have the right culture, you can maybe keep a a team together uh, a bit longer. It was kind of strange how quickly I just thought, oh yeah, coaching staff can do it. Put a new group together, mix them around, come up with an NCAA tournament team, maybe a sweet 16 team or something even better. But I think in some of those years, Chris, we really did see it's got to be a mixture. You've got to have guys who are foundational pieces of your program already. And then you add a Mooney, you add a Bryson Williams, yep. but they're with a Culver uh, or they're with a McCuller and a Shannon at that time. So when you get into this season and you had guys, obviously, that played for you previously, but you know we're not necessarily, aside from Kevin O'Banner, guys that I would consider to be foundational pieces. And when we're talking about O'Banner, 
what was he here for? A couple of hours <laughs> prior to this year? I mean, it wasn't like you're on top of year. So I, I don't know how you find that mix, but I'm going to be very interested in seeing how, if it comes to fruition, that Grant McCaslin is going to be Texas Tech's head coach. He finds that mix. He was asked about some teams from smaller conferences uh, getting wins in the NCAA tournament and beyond here recently. And I thought his answer, which I want to bring to you, kind of um, included some thoughts on what we're talking about here, what he sees being successful and maybe you can kind of extrapolate from that what you believe to possibly be his methodology to put together a team if he were to arrive at Lubbock someday as Texas Tech's head coach. Here is Grant McCaslin. With experience, but not only experience, like older experience, but experience in your program I think is huge. And you look at like FAU, for example, in our league, uh, Marshall was – I mean, um, sorry, uh, UAB was picked to win our league, and they returned a lot of the talent from the previous year but dusty the fau they returned everybody i mean there was nobody on that roster that plays that wasn't on their team one guy didn't play because he was red shirting but they played everybody was on that team and we beat them at the end of the year in a pretty pivotal game to win the league and they remembered it so when we played fau twice this year and the second time we played them at their place they came out with an edge to win that game like we had taken something from them and that's hard uh, to develop in one season. And I think the teams that have some continuity, none of those guys left. They came back for a purpose, and their purpose was to win. It just helps when you bring back a team. And that's what we were able to do when we beat Purdue. We had everybody back from a team that was a conference champion. And they didn't come back because they wanted to try to get in the NBA draft, not that that wasn't important. But they came back because they wanted to win. So I think that's the leveling it's like experience matters, but experience that's been together can really win games. Yeah, I, I think the, the the last way he phrases that experience together uh, does matter. I, I think we've seen examples like Kansas State's going to be a great example of a team that really just got put together and had it was wildly successful in just one year. And there's going to be a lot of coaches that maybe lose their jobs or feel a lot of pressure because of those examples. That is clearly the exception. Uh, to, to 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 this situation though, because I, I think to your point, what you what you were saying when you, you I think you called it foundational pieces with, with Texas Tech's roster this past year. You, you know when you when you sprinkled in those Tariq Owenses and Matt Mooney's, you put them next to the Culvers and and people like that. I think even last year, it, it, it was the 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 Kevin McCullers and the T.J. Shannons and the Clarence Nadonis and. Yep some of those culture pieces. Odiase like, was another example from Norris the from, team. Yeah. Absolutely. This is how we do it here. This is how it goes. This is the expectation, you know, uh, adapt. And this is, and this is kind of, and, and you're here to make us better because you bring a unique skill set that our coaching staff feels like. And then, you know, there was a mesh, but when you get rid of the Malik Wilson's last year, you get rid of the Clarence Nadolny's last year, you get rid of, you know, the, the Shannons and the McCullers, you know, you're asking a lot of Kevin O'Banner, who's you're right, just had a cup of coffee here, and and, and doesn't really because I mean, at some points this year, I think you're kind of asking, what is our culture, and who and who is upholding it? Who is yeah? Who embodies it? Exactly. Yeah. Who, who who's policing the locker room? Who who's who's the spokesperson for the team and all those things? Because th those are culture things, and, and when there's no experience to rely on, and it. You, you, you're not asking Bacho to do this. He barely played a year ago. You're not asking KJ Allen to do this. He he didn't. He barely played a year ago, you know. But but these these were your culture uh, pieces. Jalen Tyson was on your team last year, but didn't even play. He was only here for a semester, you know. So but that that was that's what the holdover was. And I I think that it's just a bit tricky, especially when you got guys that are coming in here. Uh, that, that are that are it's their first taste of big time college athletics and college basketball. And all that, they have no idea what to expect. I will say, those freshmen were better off in the second half of the conference season than they were in the first because you're you're looking at it. But I, I think I think what Grant's been able to do at North Texas is like kind of largely keep that group together. Now, did he have anybody that was that he was fearful of losing to the NBA draft? No. Did he have anybody that was so outlandishly good? that people are trying to buy them or, or offer them a ton of money to get into the portal. Not necessarily because Tyler Perry is the best player on his team conference USA player of the year. He's five foot 11. So some people may not 
want to want to dabble with some of that, but the point still stands because he's got he's got culture because he's got experience together. Uh, but but there's always going to be a happy medium here, in my opinion. You, yeah. You're you're going to be a part of the portal every year. I just think I, I firmly believe that, uh, and, and I, I think though that. But there's got to be a happy medium. You need some culture guys and then you just kind of sprinkle uh sprinkle it in and there's going to be some of those quote-unquote culture guys that say you know what i'm going to be vlad goldine i want to go play more i'm I'm going to go i'm I'm going to be the one transfer that that florida atlantic does have uh but but i want to play more i I appreciate everything about this place but i just simply want to get on the floor more and i know i'm not going to do it here but uh that'll be and that's the first here's who i feel sorry for Callan, and this long uh, holdover that we've been in right now. This just this 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 timeout that we've been uh, you know enduring here yeah. as as we wait are, are the are those players because they don't really have anybody to to, to go talk to uh, with a double T on their shirt necessarily. They're just kind of there's nobody really in that building holding it down per se. Um, you know they're they're creatures of habit and routine. And there's going to be a lengthy line of people wanting to talk to Coach McCaslin whenever this becomes official. I, I do believe it will. Uh, you know, and, and everybody's going to have to continue to be more patient because they all want to know, how do I fit in? What are your thoughts? Uh, what do you run? Do, do, do you have a, a, a need for a player that, that has my skill set or size or whatever? And so this is going to kind of drag into the weekend and next week, in my opinion, uh, as it relates to the players. But those are the kids, man, because I think this shocks their world. They're, they're this is their leader. This is their you know they, they they need to know who to take direction from on a daily basis, routine, and really that's just been non-existent for them in what three weeks now. I guess it's it's, it's essentially been. Yeah, it's it's kind of crazy to wonder uh, maybe who could be bridging uh, bridging the gap if anybody out there. Yeah. Uh, as you look for the next guy. Uh, Chris, I, I want to stay with Coach McCaslin, but uh, pivot away a little bit from the team-building aspect, but still looking back to some thoughts from Coach McCaslin because uh, you told me that you dialed the way back machine up, <laughs> went back to an introductory press conference from Grant McCaslin as he arrived as the head coach at North Texas. And uh sounded like maybe there was a little to learn possibly about – maybe some reasoning or just some perspective as to how he handles things. And maybe we can apply that to this kind of situation. But what what did you hear and what were some of the takeaways? But first, today's episode brought to you by America's number one sports book, FanDuel. And with the NCAA tournament on and popping right now is the perfect time to get busy, get signed up, and get started with FanDuel. And right now, new customers are in a prime spot to be on the receiving end of that no sweat first bet. We're talking up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet don't bank, baby. $1,000. So just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on and sign up today to claim your no sweat First bet, then you can lay it all on the line on everything from the money line to point spreads, which team is cutting down the nets, all on an app that's safe, secure, super easy to use, even if you're a first timer. So don't miss your shot at the no sweat first bet up to 1000 bucks when you join FanDuel today. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up and make every moment more with FanDuel. Uh, you told me that you dialed the way back machine up, <laughs> went back to an introductory press conference from Grant McCaslin as he arrived as the head coach at North Texas. And uh sounded like maybe there was a little to learn possibly about maybe some reasoning or just some perspective as to how he handles things. And maybe we can apply that to this kind of situation. But what what did you hear and what were some of the takeaways? So I, I, I think, you know, I guess this is what – this is maybe the sixth year at North Texas and there in Denton for, for coach McCaslin. And he came there from Arkansas state. And so I went back and, and watched this um, just because I just wanted a, a, a feel for, you know, potentially being able to compare, you know, what he said then and what, what he may say, uh, you know, here, here in, uh, in a couple of days uh, here in Lubbock, if, if this is the way it, it goes as we think. And, he, he he barely gets going 
in, into that introduction and and he he stops and pauses and wants to thank the not the administration as much as the players at Arkansas State and he has a really hard time getting through it and I I think that at, at first glance you I mean emotionally I get, he was very much so okay. and I and I think that as I watch this I think that that gives you a really good idea of why he's being so above board and respectful to his current team and situation right now. Hmm. Uh, because I think he, I think it's just kind of who he is uh, from a player's coach and from a, a coach in general and understands that as we're sitting here talking, I mean, these players take this stuff hard. You ride highs and lows with them and all these different things, but yeah, it, it, there were several moments of pause in there as he just kind of had to step back and, and apologize for not being able to continue at, at moments just because when he thought back to – because he's well aware that this is just the way coaching works at this level. His kids at Arkansas State were successful. That allows him the opportunity to get a job that maybe he wants closer to home at North Texas his kids at North Texas were, were very successful. That allows him to be in a position to get a job in Lubbock at the Power 5 level in the Big 12. And so I, I think that, that, that that's not lost on him, I guess is my point. Yeah. I think there's a human element to this. Everybody's wanting to fast forward to the end. We got business to conduct and all those things. But I think he is, is very much emotionally tied to some of these kids that he coaches, which I think is a great thing. It's what makes him a very good coach sure. and, and, and all those things. And I just think that point – needs to be because I'm sitting here watching it play out and we're just sitting here waiting see what's going to happen and you're just kind of waiting to see when North Texas season's going to end why is it so quiet and I think this is why I just think he's he's giving his best to his kids again you can agree with it or disagree with it but I think that uh as I watched him kind of go through that I, I'd be willing to bet that you get if we're sitting there talking about a press conference on say Friday morning or Friday afternoon I'd be willing to bet you get some awkward moments of pause as he thanks the kids at North Texas, which will have just finished their season the night before. Again, that's assuming you get something Friday. Maybe it's Saturday. Maybe it's Monday. I don't know. But uh, I just think that's worth pointing out. And while he's doing that, potentially, what kids from Texas Tech may be sitting in the front row or not? Yep, I agree. <laughs> Would be very telling. Chris, at this point, I, I suppose I don't care. I, I mean, I, timeline-wise. I've just obviously embraced the horror of having to be patient and wait. Uh, it's a virtue for a reason, you know. Uh, Got to practice in it, I suppose, to really be able to pull it off consistently. But I've, I've just embraced it. it. It is what it is at this point. And, you know, I've brought up a couple of times with you because the most, the most concerning thing, and I don't mean concerning in a bad way, but just the biggest priority, keep your team together, put a team together, whatever that actually means, either one of those things. You can't do that until guys have an idea who's going to be leading the program. So this time where we've been in limbo has always been about the players to me. I mean, I don't – yeah, sure, I'd love to know something sooner rather than later, but who cares really what I know sooner rather than later or any fan out there knows sooner rather than later. It's about keeping a roster together or building a new one as quickly as possible because everybody else you're competing with is doing the same thing right now, and they got coaches, or at least most of them do, maybe all of them. Um, but at the same time, Chris, I just feel like – when you've gotten to the point where there's been so much conversation about this, I mean, how could a player not know, I guess, what the intention is going to be? I, I floated to you a couple of times, like, are they back channeling, you know, calling whoever, Tyson or Isaacs, or like, this is our guy. You know why it's not announced yet, but this is our guy. Do you, you want to, whatever. Um, and it, I kind of feel like I was rebuffed on that, and for good reason, possibly, because I did – Talk about, you know, you're entrusting 20, 22 year old guys maybe to keep a lid on it, but the lid is off. We talk about it every day in front of millions on Locked on Texas Tech, Chris. The, the lid is off. So, like, the back channel thing may not be officially going down, but what player out there doesn't know who Texas Tech is targeting and who everyone expects to be the next Texas Tech head coach? And if you don't know, you should be subscribed to Locked on Texas Tech, Pop <laughs> Isaacs, because you would know. Surely word has gotten to Richard Isaacs, Pop's dad, as to who could be the next guy. So I may be foolish to believe that, but I do believe it, Chris. And because of that, 
I'm just like hands up on the timeline thing. Like, yeah, whatever. Okay, we'll wait till the end of the week. We're still today and yesterday getting comments, you know, on YouTube or whatever from Locked on Texas Tech viewers or listeners that speak of frustration as of this timeline. Like, man, I can't believe they're dragging us through this and yada, yada, yada. I, I don't identify with that at all at this point. I get where they were coming from because it's the same place I was coming from. Like, let's hurry up and get somebody that can get players or keep players. But by this point in time, the the timeline has been what it's been. And, you know, I, I just, I'm totally hands off of it at this point. I assume that, like we've talked about for the last uh, week, week and a half, um, you'll have your resolution when you have your resolution after the season has come to a conclusion. But I don't, I don't know that it has to be so pressing anymore. Am I right or wrong here in thinking everybody, <laughs> everybody that's in a Texas Tech universe of any kind, much less a student athlete, has heard about Grant McCaslin very likely being the next Texas Tech head coach? Where am I missing, or where am I hitting here with what I'm saying? No, I, I, I think you're, I think you're right. I just think that there's not been an official conversation, which is ultimately what it's going to take on kind of how people fit in. I will That's say, yeah. I will say, it, 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 it gives you a pretty good indication. It doesn't, you know. And again, this thing is going to be a month to six weeks to two months of trying to put a roster together and kind of seeing how this thing plays out. There'll be an initial wave of of things, and then it's just going to kind of. Uh, yeah. morph and, and get tweaked and everything but you have a pretty good idea of who ultimately wants to stay here based on who's not gotten into the portal now they may have reasons for not getting into the portal but I think they're letting it play out frustrated or not they're letting it play out whereas other people maybe have gotten in there and keeping options open they're kind of like you know what I'm moving on I'm, I'm not going to sit and wait which maybe they just don't didn't want to be here no matter who the coach is I, I don't know well, in some cases, like Canadian or otherwise, seven feet or otherwise, you don't go back and rob the bank the next day after you robbed it the day before. I mean, that just seems almost <laughs> foolish, Chris. Yeah, just a general example. Yeah, th th there's probably documentaries about that actually, uh, and, and and you know what? If there if there is one out there, I'd like to watch it. But uh, yeah, because and, and you mentioned because honestly. The first thing he's going to do is not, it, to me, it's not really about visiting with the players. It's putting staff together. You know, that's the True. first component because at that point you can kind of have some help, you know, like helping you kind of maneuver putting the roster building together and helping you meet with people, whatever it may be. Uh, I just think that that's the first component. And he may have a really good idea, as we talked about in yesterday's show, about some of those key pieces. But there's a variety of pieces. I mean, you, you're talking about a list of 10 to 15 people that he can put next to him in, in a variety of different roles, from ops to video to assistant coaches to graduate assistant to uh, even the in-between, like personal assistants to – you know, all, all those all those kinds of things. This is where you inserted the joke yesterday show about the traveling secretary. Uh, George Still looking Spencer. for that job. That's right. That's right. Still that's looking right. for that job. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you won the World Series in six games. Yeah, right. um, Come on, Bernie. Uh, I, but uh, here's something else that I, I thought was pretty fascinating to me is I, I held on to these things. He, you know, Coach McCaslin did a radio interview in the Metroplex a couple of days ago, I guess it was. Yeah. And – there was two things that he said, and I think it speaks to why he's been able to keep his team together and why they are good defensively and why they they win more than they lose, okay, a lot more than they lose. And I thought it was two pretty simple statements that I think will play really well in Lubbock, and I think it will play really well when, when defense is kind of your identity. And, and the first thing that he said in the midst of that interview is the toughest team usually wins. You know, Chris Beard used to say this, uh, you know, but I, I, I think the, the most aggressive, the toughest, I mean, I, and, and that, that's, it's true. It, it just is. And I think the, and, and what is toughness? Well, in some ways it's, it's doing the stuff that nobody wants to do. You, you rebound, you take charges, you dive on the floor, you do all the, the the blue collar type stuff, and that's what that's why this brand of basketball plays well in this part of the state because there's so many of the people that can relate to that kind of behavior because we're we're working hard. We're you know you're you're out in the in the in the fields. You're you're the oil and gas industry. You know UMC. I mean, all, all just there's a lot of blue collar work ethic uh, in this 
you know, I'm sure I missed a variety of different, uh, you know, companies and fields, but you get what I'm saying. The, the other thing that he said, and this maybe is the most important thing, is that winning is more important than individual accomplishments. And I think that's one thing that I'm not sure. I, I think the team two years ago or, or last year, the Sweet 16 team that lost to Duke, I think that is the epitome of what they were about for the most part. I think this year's team, I, I don't know if they ever like gelled that way. Hence the reason that the defense suffered or the defense was non-existent at times. There is no sacrificing for the other guy. I'm worried about this or getting mine or I didn't get my shots or I'm not getting enough minutes or, or whatever it may yeah. be. Uh, but I think those kinds of things play really, really well. And that's why, to me, why Grant's teams win and why they're good on defense and I think why kids maybe stay. You know, they, they don't they don't leave or transfer or, or want to go somewhere else or whatever it may be. So I just think those are two culture statements that he happened to m- mention in the midst of that interview that I think uh, will play well. And I wonder if we'll hear something similar uh, fairly soon with uh, maybe let's go gray suit, red tie. That, that'll be my prediction. <laughs> I uh... – I think you better recruit the right guys if you're going to try to be tough-minded, defensively oriented, because obviously that uh, that takes a tough-minded individual, um, someone that's interested in actually doing everything and, and not just getting buckets or not just being uh, a scorer. If you're going to have that type of program, that type of culture, you better make damn sure you're recruiting the right kind of guys to be a part of that, because obviously that could become uh, a nightmare very quickly if guys are getting into it and realizing – uh, I ain't built for this and I'm out. So I think that part of it is something that's really got to be uh, thoroughly vetted or whatever way you want to call it. Uh, if you're going to go that route and I would love to go that route once again, because it's treated you very, very well, obviously in some recent seasons, Chris. And I know that, you know, one of the, the, I don't know if it's a beef or criticism or whatever concerns about a Grant McCaslin basketball program has been your ability to score the basketball and what type of athletes you can or cannot attract uh, as a result of doing it very well, or maybe struggling on the offensive end, or at least not having like an offensive oriented identity. But to me, just one fan's opinion. Don't care about that in any way, shape or form. I've never found any particular ugliness or beauty to be satisfying or unsatisfying within the game. Only that sight for sore eyes that's known as your team having one more point than the other guy at the end of the game. So we all know what it can look like when you root your program and that kind of identity. We've lived that, but we've also lived that simultaneously with the most successful basketball seasons you've had in the history of your program, at least some of them. So I, I don't know, Chris, how you address, you know, really trying to be a program that's exciting for kids to want to be a part of because that defensive identity as we're running down here really does require commitment, selflessness, and tough-mindedness versus something that maybe is a little flashier offensively. But I'll take my chances every day of the week and twice on Sunday investing on the defensive end of the floor and those blue-collar traits that, that you're identifying there if I just had my choice, again, maybe right or wrong, and I'm sure there are plenty of fans out there who might disagree with that, but going off of some recent evidence that it could be really successful in the Big 12 Conference and in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, and you know, now we, uh, I guess at, at what, 8.40 tonight, uh, UAB and, and uh, North Texas will play for the third time this year. Uh, I think North Texas has beaten UAB twice already this year, once by – three once by nine so trying to beat a team for the third time but i I think uh you know friday morning is you know now that we know when north texas's last game will be uh i'm I'm sure there's you know uh, we'll we'll, we'll get some news fairly soon you know And, and, and and i will say too in the midst of some of these interviews, like the introductory press conference when he took over the north texas job and the radio interview that he did the metroplex I mean, he's telling you flat out, I came to to this North Texas job because of so much family here. And he pauses then, too. It's very emotional. Uh, I think originally from Irving, maybe, I think is where Grant grew up. And then I think he tells the the folks on the the Metroplex radio station there, hey, I have about 50 family members, you know, close or otherwise, that are are at our home games every time. And – 
I think he's indicated that his wife uh, was going to have a hard time if they ever left. Now, she does have a degree uh, from from Texas Tech and played soccer uh, here. But still, I, I just think that it, it's there's more to these moves than – but th- this is the next logical step in a, in a basketball coach's career when, when you get a chance to – not to take a shot at Conference USA or North Texas. And, and I'll tell you, I think in the midst of that radio interview – he was actually asked something to the effect of, and I think this is a great look into, into the reasons why the Power Five trump card, it, it, it means so much. And, and, and so let me explain real fast. It, he's asked, do you think because of Conference USA's success right now that if the conference, uh, if, if the NCAA tournament gets expanded a bit, D- does Conference USA maybe get an extra bid or two going forward in, 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 in like in a normal situation? And he flat out was like, I respect the question. I think it is something along the lines of what he said, but he's like, but I don't think that's the case. No. And, and he explained that the metrics that they have decided to use really favor the, the, the power five type schools that are in the, the big leagues that play, really kind of tougher non-conference schedules. So he's telling you that he's in a league right now that that even when if they expand it, you know, you get you get one or two bids at the most, you know, uh, in, in some cases. Uh, but it, it's, you know, what did the Big 12 have? What was it, seven this year? Seven out of ten? And so I, I think that's a good look behind the curtain into the way – yeah. That that particular sport, that's the way it works, you know. Sure. Well, it's not it's not the second or third place team in Conference USA that's uh lost in the wash typically. It's like the 6th, 7th or 8th team in one of those Power 5 or Big East type leagues, right? That maybe doesn't make the tournament and I'm actually not mad maybe those guys getting more postseason opportunity because it's easy to make the case, Chris. I mean, I, I think most people understand typically, like you don't have the 64 best teams in the country in the tournament. You're just ranking one through 64. Right. Whatever the number is now, 68. But yeah, I, I think, am I wrong? I think what he's saying there is is true in that it's not like the middle of the of Conference USA all of a sudden gets a boost now. It's probably more of those from those bigger leagues that get a You're boost. You're exactly there. right. And you increases your chances because what, 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 are, what have people's criticisms been – uh, about Coach McCaslin and oh, just one trip to the NCAA tournament and in, in his five or six years at North Texas, you know they did win a game when they went, but that, that's all people judge it by. And so you go where you get easier access because you have to be darn near perfect. I mean, the team's about to win thirty games, and it wasn't. It, it, you heard him talk about his net ranking, you turn road record, I mean all right. the stuff that people look at, but he's just not in a strong enough league based on the way the metrics judge it. And we already know what the Big 12 uh, went through this year and how the metrics were for that league. So I, I just think you increase your chances because all you need to do is get in. Yeah, you love to be seated high. You love a good locale. Yeah, you love to play your, your first and second round games in Dallas like you were able to do in that uh, 2000, I guess, 18 season. But just getting in, is that's how you're ultimately judged. you know. And I think Texas Tech views itself as a program – that should be going to the tournament every year or, or, or more often than not. Uh, and so anyway, I just think that was uh, a little look of, uh, as to who he is, h- how he's emotionally tied to, you know, again, family's important. His players are important. Uh, he, he, he gets emotionally invested here. But you also look at the business side of it in that the, the Big 12 allows me for easier access to where – how we're ultimately judged in this sport. So they can yeah. get a good, good look behind the curtain there. It's kind of his thinking. That, that's interesting. Maybe not lost on all college basketball fans, but maybe some not realizing how that might break down and what the incentive is just beyond money and obviously bigger league and things like that. But what the incentive would be uh, in a league like the big 12 versus uh, something otherwise. All right. We got to get out of here. Stick with us because come tomorrow. Could we have an official announcement? Could there be smoke coming from the bell tower over at the administration building on the campus of Texas Tech University? If there is, that could be cause for concern because we don't have any official procedure for releasing smoke. So everybody stand by just in case. I don't know if there's a red flag fire wind weather warning, but it's West Texas in the spring. So probably didn't know I was going to include that in the wrap up, but it just happened. That's just a little PSA for you. Hopefully, Chris, 
If we're talking Grant McCaslin on the other side, we are talking about a guy that is very close to having been or already has been announced as Texas Tech's new head coach. As to when you have introductory press conferences, things like that remains to be seen, but expecting Friday to be an exciting day. So make sure you're back with us on the other side. Subscribed on YouTube if you haven't already, so you miss nothing. You get it when it hits the scene or anywhere you get podcasts. As maybe we are finally wrapping up this saga. I should say this chapter because you've pointed out it's only a chapter. Next, it's staff time and it's roster time. And man, we're just at the beginning of that whirlwind. (laughs) Yes, we are. Long way to go here. Thanks for the time, Chris. Enjoyed it as always, man. Keep hope alive. Yes, sir. We'll talk to you uh, tomorrow. We'll see what happens. You got it. We're back to wrap it up on Locked On Texas Tech. Make us your first listen on YouTube or anywhere you get podcasts. Wrap up the week, I meant. The show's going to live on into another week. I hope at least. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe there's some news coming this weekend. <laughs> we'll be back tomorrow for your first listen on YouTube or anywhere you get podcasts. Make sure you check out Locked On College Basketball for your second listen right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. For Chris... I'm Casey. Have a great one. We'll see you next time around on Locked on Texas Tech.